eager statistician has worked out there's something approaching 10,000 miles ahead of me as we prepare to kick off another season of road shows. Our first stop is Bolton Abbey near Skipton in the heart of the Yorkshire Dales. It's beautiful country. This railway line was built in Victorian times for tourists who flocked to the moors on day trips to escape the pollution of nearby towns. And for only a shilling and sixpence, or seven and a half p to you and me, it was a cheap day out. But it wasn't just fresh air they were after. A wonderful relic of medieval England was hiding just a short walk away from the station, the ruins of Bolton Abbey. But their journey wasn't over yet. Visitors would have to cross the River Wharf whoa, on these stepping stones to get to the Abbey, and the water's quite deep. Ooh. And it's still the same to get to the Abbey today. Once you get here, hopefully dry and in one piece, it's certainly worth it. The ruins were once a monastery and Henry VIII in 1538 ransacked it during the dissolution of the monasteries. A certain Anne Boleyn had caught his eye and he wanted to free himself from the Catholic Church so that he could divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Now you may wonder why parts of this once magnificent structure have been reduced to piles of stones. Well, it's quite simple. Over the years, the locals would come along to the ruins and help themselves to the stones. And they reckon that many a handsome house round here has been built out of the abbey. But one small section was salvaged and restored, forming today the parish church. It gives us a real sense of what the monastery would have looked like. Thankfully, this altar was salvaged. It's the only original bit left. And the ruins are the backdrop to the roadshow. We're in the grounds just next to them, the grounds of the hall at Bolton Abbey, the Yorkshire home of the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. And our experts are already busy. You've got two lovely chairs here. Let me start with the little one. This clearly a child's chair. Yes. Did you ever sit in this? No, I was grown up by the time we got that. Well, I was certainly too big for it. <laughs> right, right. But the yes. grandchildren... I bet they have fun in it, don't they? Yes, and now the teddies live in it. <laughs> oh, sweet, isn't it? It's lovely. It looks like a piece of oak furniture. It, yes. it is actually made of pine, and you can see if you look at the sides, what they've done here. This decoration here is called scumble painted. So it's all done by hand, painted yes. to look like a piece of oak. Right. That's the best cut of oak, the quarter sawn oak, but it's a fake. Yes. So what it means is this pine was so cheap that you could afford to do this and pay the man's labour to paint it to look like oak because the oak was too expensive to yes, buy. Yes, yeah. I have a feeling it's probably come up from Wales, something mm -hmm. like that. You know, the miners yeah. came up and bought the styles up from the mines when they started working in Yorkshire. A lovely little chair, made about 1800, so about 200 years old, something like that. Good grief, it's sweet, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But uh, let's go to this one. This is just lovely. What do you call this? I think technically it's called the lambing chair. Why? Because, well, obviously in lambing time the farmers would sit up all night and all day and things and it has these sides on it and I think at one time it might have had a, a temporary hood on it, as often some of them did, basically to keep the draughts off you and be warmer. It's exactly what the, these sides are for, for the draughts, but it's interesting, are you, are you a farming family or something? Yes, yeah. yes. Did you ever yeah. use it for lambing? No. All my memories of my father are sat in this chair. Right. Um, and we played in it as children, and my mother used to sit and eat at the table with it, because there was eight of us, and she used to end up in the old chair. <laughs> and... and let's get the date out of the way. I think it's made late 18th century, early 19th century. The same sort of date as the little chair, circa 1800. We can't be much more accurate than that. No. So it's, again, no. 200 years old plus. Yes, yes, tremendous um, age. I mean, you can see it's clearly made of oak, this one. The whole thing is a lovely oak frame. There's a, this thing underneath here, which yes. may or may not have been replaced, this, the seat. It doesn't matter if it has, it's irrelevant. In there, you might think you keep a potty. Well, you could keep a potty in there. Yes. And they're often used for the Bible. 
because that was the important book of the house, and it was yeah. a dry area, off the damp floor. But there's a wonderful story that in the late 19th century, so just over 100 years ago, there was a burglary up here somewhere. Yes. The, the family were in the house. The burglars told Granny to sit down in the chair. So she sat down in one of those big, big, wide skirts of the time, mm. the late 19th century. The thieves escaped with whatever. All the family valuables <laughs> and jewels were in the chair, so they oh, didn't the... get anything really important. <laughs> That's wonderful, yes. Well, we're going to have to value these. Have you any idea? No, I wouldn't like to hazard a guess. Well, the little one, as the children have left it in pretty good condition despite playing on it, let's say at auction price between about eight and twelve hundred pounds. Good grief, yeah. Quite popular. Mm. This is not, not so easy. I'm <laughs> going to say, again at auction, two to three thousand. Good grief, yeah. And I wonder mm. if I'm just being a little bit conservative. That is certainly a surprise, and I know my family will be surprised. They're just family, family chairs to us. I believe it to be a paperweight. Paperweight? Yeah, I think that's what it is. What do you know about it? Um, well, the wife's grandmother passed away a few years ago. She's right. one of four sisters, and before they sold the estate, they were each allowed to take an object from the house as a keepsake. Right. And the wife chose And this the, was the object? Yeah, the yeah. paperweight. It looks superficially similar to millions and millions of Chinese and Czechoslovakian paperweights that we see mm. on the roadshow all the time. Yeah. Have you noticed anything special about it? Anything that might set it aside? Um, the only thing I've noticed is there's a letter B and the date 1848 inside the glass. Letter B and date 1848. That's just... Where is it? Just on that piece of glass there. Ah, yes, I can see that. Hmm. Yeah, it's what we call a close packed Mille Fiori paperweight. Right. Each one of these little circular features is called a cane. And the canes are of varying designs. What's nice about this paperweight are these little silhouette canes that you can just see there. There's one, what is he? Looks like a little man or a devil. It's another one of a horse. And what sets this paperweight aside is that it was made in France oh, right. in the mid 19th century. 1848 is the date. And the B, can you guess what B might stand for? I wouldn't. You heard of Saint Louis? No, not Clichy, at all. Clichy? No. Baccarat? I've heard of Bert Baccarat. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a different, but this isn't Bert. Uh, this is the French Baccarat. And right. the B on this paperweight stands for Baccarat. Okay. Uh, Baccarat, one of these big three makers, the best mid 19th century French paperweights. And the 1848 is the date that this piece was made. Right. Weights of this type were made by Baccarat between 1845 and 1851. Oh. I have to tell you that 1848 is the most common date. But the 1848s have this wonderful, brilliant colour scheme, much brighter and fresher yeah. than the other dates. So there's still a reasonable demand amongst paperweight collectors. For, I've got no idea what it might be worth. No, none at all. I thought about £50. Pounds £50, well. pounds, which is what one of these bog standard yeah. Chinese or Bohemian ones that a lot of paperweight collectors buy are worth. Mm. But this weight is rather more interesting. I think uh, at auction this paperweight would sell for around £2,000. Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a lot for a, piece quite of, a, lot for a small something, piece of glass. A small yeah. piece of glass that, you know, superficially looks quite ordinary. I know. These are rather the colours of today, aren't they? All these amazing greens, it's so lush at the moment, yeah, and, uh, and so is this beautiful garden. Yeah, it's a lot uh, totally relaxing. It is, and, and she is totally like, relaxing, yeah, isn't yeah, she? Totally. Does it relax you to look at it? Uh, it does, actually. When I first saw it, it was hanging in a rather dark part of a landing at my family home, and I was moving into my flat, so I uh, pinched it, ah. <laughs> hoping that the family wouldn't notice, <laughs> which is fine until the first viewing of my flat, and there, of course, it was pride of place. <laughs> what, you mean they didn't notice it until <laughs> Not then? Not at first. <laughs> <laughs> didn't it leave a sort of light patch on uh, the wall? Well, it, well I, yeah. I substituted it with a very inferior painting. So. Clever! <laughs> Similar colours. <laughs> it, it's an oil painting, right. but of course it's dried out a lot with age. Yeah. Uh, when it's cleaned, it's going to really sparkle. I can't right. tell you what a transformation it would be. Right. But um, the way it's painted, is, is quite clever because it's painted quite thick right? and there are dabs of it that actually stick out off the canvas, oh, yeah. which yeah. are quite fun, right. and, uh, and give it some texture. Right. It's signed Talmadge. 1921. And Talmadge, you probably know, is Algernon Talmadge. Right. No, yeah? I didn't know that. Oh, right. <laughs> Algernon Mayon 
Talmadge. Right, yeah. right. And, uh, and he was rather an interesting artist, I think. Mm -hmm. um, part of a group that uh, uh, were all taught by uh, a German who was fleeing the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 ah. called Sir Hubert von Herkimer. Right. And he set up a school yeah. uh, in Bushy, near Watford. Ah. And lots of uh, quite interesting painters went there, including yeah. Lucy Kemp Welsh, who painted horses. Oh, right. Yeah. And um, another chap called Armsby Brown, who painted uh, really quite similarly broad brush light paintings, you'd mm -hmm. have to say. Because that's what this picture's about, isn't right. it? It's yes. about yeah. light through trees and yeah. through fabrics and on things as well, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's all trickery, of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I quite like the way he's used these very dun colours and then yeah. suddenly you get this very electric sort of green that's yeah. laid on top of it and through it. And that's what gives the impression of the dappled sunlight. Ah, right. And then right. if you really look at the marks, try and forget what they're trying to represent, but yeah. the actual just flex of this rather attractive peach colour that's yeah. on the canvas of the hammock. Right. And, uh, and it is completely convincing of light through it, yeah, isn't it? Through, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but overall, she's very beautiful. I think she's mm. just put a fan down. I think she's holding something in her ah, right hand, yeah. isn't she? Yes, she is. So yeah. she, and it's yeah. like she's just sort of relaxed for a moment. And, works, uh, and there's yeah. this marvellous feeling of indolence about the painting. Yeah. But uh, she's got um, slightly worryingly thick ankles, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just right. can't help but notice them. It's what, right. what my mother used to call Shropshire ankles. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. I, say, I have lots of people from Shropshire writing in now yes. saying they've got beautifully thin ankles. But, <laughs> but actually, and I don't mean anything against the people of Shropshire, but that's an expression that I heard for thick ankles. Excellent. Now, I suppose if you were to sell this painting, mm -hmm. um, a conservative auction estimate might be ten to fifteen thousand pounds. Oh, right. Yes, right. quite right. easily, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's good. But were you to buy the painting or to be offered it, yeah. uh, I think it's very likely you'd have to pay something like £20,000. Oh, really? So, right. so certainly so you should insure difference. it for that. Right. Would it be worth more if it was cleaned or...? Um, well, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. Right. And so right. if you just bunged it in a sale, I think yeah. uh, people might quite enjoy the, the revealed as it, as it, value, yeah. as it were, of doing right. it themselves. Ah, right. Yeah. Oh, so so yeah. sometimes yeah. there's even a premium to, to having it slightly dirty. Ah, right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but a lovely picture. So we have got a copy here of uh, Mrs. Gaskell's Life of Charlotte Bronte. Yes. Um, obviously author of everything um, that we all know about Jane Eyre and all the rest of it. Uh, yes. Dated 1858, but it's in appalling condition. I know, it is. It's been yes. stabbed. Yes. And <laughs> the frontispiece has come, come away. I know. Which is terrible. And look at the, the binding. I know. It's water stained and all the rest of it. Well, I bought it like that. You bought it like that. <laughs> yes. But the thing that you pointed out to me, which I hadn't realised when you first showed it to me, was this fabulous inscription. Yes. Here yes. on the front. Now tell me where you got it from. Well, I bought it in a flea market in a church hall mm -hmm. um, about 15 years ago. And it was in just a cardboard box uh, full of old books. And I'm a very keen Bronte fan, you know. I really love the Brontes and I recognise the signature straight away. And so the signature here reads uh, Reverend P. Bronte, A.B. And so, you know, this is Patrick Bronte, the yes. father yes. of all the Bronte girls. Yes. Absolutely yes. splendid. Incumbent of Haworth, Yorkshire, yes. 1858. Yes. Um, yes. That's absolutely amazing. And did they know that no. it was him? I don't think they So have. it was your discovery? Yes, it was. It was your yes. discovery? Yeah. And you've had it authenticated? Yes, I took it to the Bronte Parsonage at Haworth and they, um, they authenticated it. Well, it's, it, is, it is absolutely right. Yes, it's it says AB. AB. Because mm. in those days they used to sign it AB, Bachelor of Arts, rather than as we sign it today, BA. BA, mm, there was... that's right. So we've got to come down to the price. Oh, yes. What did you pay? A pound. What, a whole pound? Yes. <laughs> For a chatty book like this? Yes. <laughs> with that inscription? Yes. Well, I suppose if I had to value it, and I didn't mm. think I ever would value such a chatty book on the Antiques Roadshow, okay. um, I would say that it was worth somewhere in the region of two to three hundred pounds. Gosh. So <laughs> that was a pound well spent. It was, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. So you, you put this on a board yes. when you inherited it or were yes. given it? Yes, I inherited it from my late mother who passed away in 2001. And my family background is part Canadian. Her family is all from Canada, so uh, that's 
I assume is the origin of it, North American beadwork. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're yeah. right. And have you ever done any beadwork? I have. I've dabbled in beadwork, yes. And, and <laughs> Not to this a, extent. <laughs> I was going to no. say, because it is very sophisticated, isn't it? It if, is, If you yes. look really carefully, I mean, starting up here, it's, it's fairly straightforward. The very tiny beads, which mm -hmm. would have been blown glass. And I think this is probably around 1850. What's so lovely about it is it would have been round the waist and it would have been oh, dangling like oh, this. That's interesting. And that. you can see how it does open here. Mm. Nothing in it, I suppose. No, I did check. I did check. <laughs> what I think is fascinating, you see that. It's very difficult to see unless you look at it sideways, but that is in relief. Oh. And, and I believe that underneath that it has um, a little bit of padding. Mm to bring it out in relief, which gives it a, a three-dimensional look. Yes, yes. And you brought two dolls and yes. a lovely bed. Tell yes. me about them. They belong to my late grandmother, my Canadian grandmother. Um, she was born in 1895. Right. So I imagine she would have been given them as a young girl. These are, are both German. This is um, Armand Marseille, quite a common doll. Mm -hmm. But this is the one I'm interested in. She's sleeping at the moment. She's known as a, a three-faced doll bisque and with three faces there she is crying she's actually got two tears wonderful to play with if you're a child <laughs> yeah. and there she is laughing now did you know she had that underneath no. now i hope she is going to perform oh, oh gosh i think it's meant to be mama I not papa so. don't you <laughs> it's a little squeak now but well, at least she's yes. still got a voice. Gosh. So often that's the one that's thing that goes. That's very interesting. I didn't know that either. So that's rather lovely. Yeah. It's, it's a true little doll that, mm -hmm. that um, performs for you without yes. buying three different dolls mm -hmm. and having them all in one. So that's absolutely lovely by Karl Bergner right. of Sonneberg in Germany. And um, very collectible. Mm. And she goes beautifully in this bed, doesn't she? Do you think the bed's from the same time period, or I'm not it sure? It could myself. well be. The mm. doll is circa 1895, just about right. when your okay. grandmother was born. The bed is so enchanting because so often they're just plain mm. white spindles, and you've got this lovely decoration on it as well. So, have you any idea? What, what <laughs> no, was? I know it's always been very precious in the family because of the provenance of being yes. handed down, but I, I don't know values of dolls. And the beads? Again, I have seen some larger collections on the Antiques Roadshow um, and I've been quite astounded by the value. Yes, yeah. If this were to go into a Native American mm. sale, if you like, folk art in New York, yes. I, I can see this going for well over a thousand pounds. Here we might be lucky to get five or six hundred, but yes. now with the internet and everything else, mm -hmm. you, you could be looking at a thousand pounds, which is really good. Okay. This one, much less than the other one, about £100. Oh, right. And this one, the three-faced Karl Bergner, mm. around £1,200. Gosh, it's exciting. <laughs> we tend to think of cuckoo clocks as being much more ornate with carved birds, carved flowers, carved leaves and wood, and the two or three fir cone weights hanging down below. Yeah. But this is rather nicer, isn't it? It's a nice clock. Is it working? I mean, is the cuckoo doing its thing? Yes. He says, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me down. No, I won't let you down. I'll let you do it. If you move the hand round for me to 11, we'll see whether or not he's going to let you down or perform. amazing Dunhill lighter. I mean, you don't strike me as a smoker, so how can we have such a lovely thing? Well, I'm not a smoker, but my friend's father used to have it on his desk um, to put his clients at their ease and mm. light a cigarette for them. But it's just something that I've always admired and uh, lovely. It's such a, a gorgeous thing, and the main thing is the condition. I mean, I don't know if you know at all about um, Dunhill, but the firm was started in the 1880s, and this is actually very late. It was the 1950s when these were made, and they became fashionable. I mean, aquarium lighters is, is what they're known as. The process of, of how these were made, it was all made by one chap who developed the process, and they would grind out the lucite, which is uh, an early form of of plastic uh, to form like a, a recess and then infill with all the colours and the fish and uh, you've got 
a guppy there, I think, and I'm not particularly good on fish. I mean, does it take pride of place on the mantel, please? Yes, it is. It's, uh, and it's greatly admired and when children come in and see it and they just love looking at the fish. It's just a great object. It's lovely, isn't mm. it? Yeah. These days, I mean, it, it sort of bucks the trend, really, because uh, smoking is so non-PC at the moment. But great news is these are so widely collected now that it's easily two to three thousand pounds. Good grief. <laughs> yeah. Really? Oh That's a God. lot of cigarettes. It is. <laughs> oh, yes. So can I ask you just to advance the hands to 11 o'clock and then we can see whether or not he's going to perform or whether he's going to let you down? Just. He's, he's OK. He's sort of cooking, but not doing the full cuckoo, is he? Not quite. He's a very exotic-looking cuckoo. They tend normally just to be sort of carved wood with the wings mm. moving. Almost got the colours of a parrot, dare I say it. But um, <laughs> anyway, looking at the clock, it's, it's very interesting because it's, it's basically rosewood veneered. It is inlaid with brass and pewter. And of course, the dial, which is enamelled, is painted with the retailer's name. Cuss & Co of Newcastle upon Tyne with the retailer. They weren't the maker. Now, I want to stress to you that this, as we mentioned earlier, is not the typical cuckoo clock yeah. that has the weights dangling down. This is a much better quality example. Much, much better. And I have to tell you that this is by one of the very best makers. This is by a man called uh, Johann Baptist Beyer from Isenbach in the Black Forest. And trademarks of his work are these lovely swirly ends to the ratchet springs. And again, this bridge here underneath the count wheel. Absolutely typical of Bayer's work. And he was working right up until the end of the 19th century, sort of the, the 1890s. I think he died somewhere around that time. So this is, this is a lovely thing and would have been comparatively expensive new compared to your usual, mm -hmm. if I can put it like this, a tourist souvenir, <laughs> your average cuckoo. Um, that, that's fine, but the other one, the other bellows there, not working, which is why we're not getting the yeah, full okay. cuckoo but you can do a repair. This is just a chamois leather bit of bellows, and that repair is fairly easy. You can sort that out. Um, I love it. It's unusual, it's fun, it's quite commercial. So yeah. have you remembered it going in the family for years and years or not? Oh, well, I've known it for 60 years, um, and it, it always worked, other than when I was small, when it was turned off, so that it didn't disturb. And my own children, when they were babies, my father used to turn it off so that the cuckoo didn't work. The price is not going to be great, but it still might be, I hope, a little surprise to you. I would suggest, oh, current uh, situation here, about £1,200, and would also fully overhauled and in a top-of-the-range shop fetch significantly more. Blimey. <laughs> One of the great things about working on Antiques Roadshow is you get to meet all the experts and to pick their brains. Now, Eric Knowles, you were a new boy here once. Hard to believe, I, I know. I was, yes. But... <laughs> 27 years ago. Oh. Yeah, came on a youth opportunity scheme and nobody believes me anymore. So tips for a newcomer? Um, humility. You need a lot of it. Because no matter how much you know, there's always somebody out there who knows more than you. Now, we're asking the experts in this series if, God forbid, the house would suddenly go up in flames and they had just had time to nip out in their pyjamas with two items, one in each hand, yeah. what would they be? Well, first of all, thank you for crediting me with being a man that wears pyjamas, and I do. <laughs> uh, but um, I've actually brought a cup and saucer and, and I've brought another item, which is my auctioneer's gavel. Now, my cup and saucer, I have to tell you, was my first big purchase back in 1971. And I had to buy it. Um, because this is 18th century porcelain, made at a place called Coffley, just up the River Severn from Worcester, dates to about 1785 because the factory was founded in 1772 and it closed in 1799. I hope you're going to pay attention because there will be a written test at the end of this series. <laughs> um, and I paid, would you believe, 
14 pounds 10 shillings for it now let me quantify that because today it doesn't sound like a lot sounds like a snip well back in 71 my take-home pay after tax was 12 pounds 10 shillings wow. so i paid over um, a week's wages for it and you might be asking me why I'll tell you now, and I don't mind admitting it, I am a die-hard romantic. It's just the romance of this business. And the idea of that would have been wrapped in straw and it would have been unpacked and put before the lady of the house and she would have admired it. And for me, it's magic. I tell you what, it's magic because it comes alive by candlelight. See, when people look at porcelain, they look at it and it's not until you see the stuff by candlelight that it just just becomes a magical entity and I've never lost my fascination for porcelain. And, and, you, and you began collecting very young though didn't you? I did, um, I mean I was collecting back in 1961 would you believe and I collected, um, wait for this, tissue wrappers. Tissue uh, wrappers? Tissue, no in those days, you'll have to ask your mum about this, in those days <laughs> um, uh, fruit was all wrapped individually in tissue and the designs were often very attractive, sometimes embossed in gilt and the great attraction was um, after the, the fact there were fabulous designs they were free Oh. <laughs> they were, and I'll tell you, you're in the land of oat for oat. Um, so how old were you when you were collecting fruit I would probably be about eight or nine. Eight or nine. And I, I became the bane of every green, greengrocer in Nelson, Burnley and Colne. Uh, they'd see me coming and put the clothes sign up. So that got you collecting. And what yes. about this then? What's the significance of this? Well, well obviously it's a gavel. It I is a gavel. And, and I've spent, you know, most of my life working as an auctioneer. And so this is an essential part of your, uh, of your job. This one actually is made from a laburnum tree and that laburnum tree used to be outside my family home and um, when, uh, when it got too uh, rickety it had to come down uh, but my dad being a very sort of canny sort of chap had all manner of objects made out of it and he has a friend who's a, a turner and, um, and he turned me a gavel. And, um, and so I that's what you've used professionally ever since? I've used this professionally ever since. I mean, this is um, one step up, really, from Harry Potter's broom, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I tell you what, I've knocked out some brass with that. <laughs> well, let's hope you never have to run out of a burning house with it. Or the cup. Thanks. Pleasure. A Wedgwood cameo. One of several cameos, and these are just the tip of your iceberg. Yes, 320. How do you get 320 Wedgwood cameos? Well, um, to cut a long story short, I last saw these when in about 1955, uh, when they were in, um, in a box, about the size of a shoe box, but not very deep. And uh, my sister and I uh, were playing some sort of matching game with them. And um, I don't remember a great deal about it, but my sister remembers uh, that we were fighting over them. We got told off, and my mother said, if you don't behave yourself and sort yourselves out, they're going away and you won't play with them again. And we didn't see them again until this January when she died and we were clearing the house out. My goodness. But how did they come into your family in the first place? <laughs> yes, well, my father worked for a firm of accountants uh, all his life, and um, he was sent out to, to firms that were going into receivership with the accountants as yeah. a junior. Uh -huh. and, and he came back with odd things. He came back with... Uh, a box of um, brass pen nibs, uh, uh, cloakroom room tickets, and... And this. Uh, this, yeah. Well, I, it's, it's a fantastic collection, and it takes us straight into the 18th century. Or does it? That's the question. Yeah. Because Wedgwood started producing cameos like this um, in the 1770s. They are absolutely epitomise the taste of the time. This is what people think of when they think of Wedgwood. They think of white reliefs, usually on the blue ground, but sometimes on a black or a, a coloured ground. And this is England going Greek, basically. Mm. Uh, this is neoclassicism. All of the houses that were being built at the time were absolutely studied with cameos, whether they were Wedgwood cameos or painted cameos. So this is very much um, what really formed the bedrock of, of Wedgwood's business. Uh, however, these are not 18th century. These are a later revival of the Wedgwood style in the late 19th century. Um, and these would have been destined either for collector's cabinets, people would sort of, uh, on, a, on, a, on a rainy afternoon, they would want to go through inspecting these uh, classical yeah. ruins, classical famous statues. What about value? Well, I looked on the, on the internet, on the standard uh, sites, and it seems to me that 
uh, they're worth what somebody would pay for them, three pounds up to 70 pounds. So some of the, some people collect um, uh, the portrait ones and they seem to be a hundred pounds. Yeah. Um, I've just no idea really how to value. Well, there, it's, there are lots of different parameters. First, mm. the first one is, how old are they? 18th century cameos are going to be more expensive than 19th century right. cameos. The unusual coloured grounds are going to be more valuable than the standard blue grounds. The blue grounds are the common ones. The sage coloured grounds, the lavender coloured grounds, highly sought after. Um, subject matter. Some of these, when they were first produced, were real current works of art. Right. You've got 350. If we average them out very crudely at ten pounds each. Well, that's three and a half thousand pounds. It's a little box full. Yeah. It's not a bad little <laughs> piece of bankrupt estate. No, no, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, this is an intriguing pine box. Let's have a look at it. So you've got a door here which opens, and then you've got two sliding pieces of wood at the top with grills below. So presumably we're looking at something for a small animal. Not exactly an animal. A bird? A bird. A bird. A bird. Right. And how did the box come into your possession? It uh, belonged to my great-grandfather, Abraham Goodall. Right. Who lived um, late 1800s, early 1900s. And obviously it's too small for a pigeon. Too small. So we're probably looking at singing birds? Yes. Yes, yes. more specifically? Skylarks. 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 This was the transportation box that he used to take the Skylarks to the contests and then he would open the flaps and they would start singing. Fascinating, because it was very much a local, well, sport is the wrong word, but of local interest, was it? Local interest, it tended to be Yorkshire and Lancashire. Yes. The majority of contests seemed to take place around the, the Cone area in, in Lancashire, Cone, Barnoldswick and Nelson. And presumably you arrived and your lark was in the box. In the and box. Then did yes. you take it out? Or? No, no. The bird stayed in the box all the time, but they used to just open the flaps to make them like sing so, when like they saw so. light. That's right. That's right. And how did they judge who was the best lark? Some of it was on time. Uh, my, grand, uh, my great grandfather had one that could sing for around about half an hour without no. stopping. No. That's right. Fantastic. Yes. I think that was a prize winner, wasn't it? It was, yes. It was champion from two years old to 12 years old. He was the national champion of England. The national champion? National champion. But did your grandfather train his larks, or was it just natural singing? No, they all had to be taught to sing. The majority of the, um, the skylarks were taken as fledglings from the nests and had to be taught how to sing. And my grandfather, being a saddler, um, would take his work up onto Belden Moor or Ilkley Moor, and he would sit for hours uh, stitching away at the, the leather and he would have the skylark sitting next to him in the box and the, uh, the bird would learn how to sing from the birds in the wild. Fascinating. Well, I think it's a <laughs> wonderful story and uh, I have never seen a box like this before uh, come up for sale, so I think it's a fascinating piece of local history, history. really, right. isn't yes. it? And yeah. so nice that you've got the family connection. And I suspect if it came up at auction, it would probably fetch in the region of two to three hundred pounds. It's an unusual oh, item, right. yeah. but I think more important is the history is and the it? family connection. That's right, yes. I'm yeah. so pleased yeah. that you bought it in. It's great to see it. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Tell me a bit about this car, because she really is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's a 1926 Citroen B12 Torpedo. Right. It's actually classed as a commercial vehicle as much as a, um, a normal car, but it has got a tailgate on the back, which they used to take the seats out when they were using it, put the tailgate down, use it as a wagon. So hold on a sec, you're driving one of the first estate cars? Yes. Technically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we could remove the back seats, put the tailgate down and turn it into a flatbed we could, in yes. essence. Yes. I want to know how you acquired it because these aren't the kind of cars obviously we see around very often. Have you owned old cars before? Yes, I've owned them previously. I went a couple of years without owning one and as car enthusiasts will appreciate, it's not a good thing when you like cars and you haven't got one. Do you work on the car yourself? I do a bit. I mean, it's a very simple block and four plugs. Yes. Um, it's not too difficult. What, uh, what size engine is this? Uh, it's just this? over a 900. So it's actually quite a small engine yes. for a car which probably weighs what in excess of maybe a ton and a yes. half I would imagine. She's got a battery I presume but do you always crank her? Yes it's 
just it's just easier for us. Why, why did they do away with starting handles? You know, I um, remember massive bruises at the arm. <laughs> I think you see. I remember I used to have an Austin A35 when I was younger. In yeah. the middle of the winter, the battery would be flat, yeah. but it would always get going. I could always it. crank her up and get her going, yeah. and that was what I liked about yeah. old cars. That kind of thing you could work on them. Later on, I had a modern car, and you open the bonnet, and it was just this flat, level thing. It didn't even have a dipstick. No. Cars like that aren't a joy to me. This is what motoring's about. It is. It's a more of an enjoyable 30 mile an hour run when you're in something like this than it is a modern car. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose we need to talk about value, really, because uh, how, ma how many of these cars do you think are actually in existence? I think there's three or four. Three or four, yeah, so that many. few. Yeah. That kind of rarity doesn't always necessarily kind of transfer into, in, into pound signs, yeah. if you'll excuse the expression, because these kind of cars are quite niche in many many ways. My feeling is this, if perhaps she came up for auction, maybe she'd be worth about seven to ten thousand pounds. Yeah, that's about right, yeah. Does that feel about yeah. right for you? But in terms of the pleasure you can have for that kind of money, I think she's worth absolutely every penny. Oh, definitely. You into aromatherapy? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not in public, anyway. Not in public. <laughs> because that's what it is, really. It's a sensor. Right. You, you put sand in there and you stick joysticks in it light them and it wafts the centre around. Right. Didn't know that. No, I didn't actually. No. I didn't. Where did you get it from? I bought it nearly 20 years ago. It was my husband's 40th birthday and I wanted something that was a little bit different for him. A friend of ours is an antiques dealer and I asked him to look out for something that was a bit special and he came back with this and I loved it the moment I saw it. What did you have to pay for it? Don't tell him. <laughs> uh, £450. Did you think that that was a, a, a not inconsiderable sum? It was quite a bit of money, but I, yeah. once I'd seen it, I Something didn't special. really want to settle for anything else. You loved it? I loved it. Yeah. Did he love it? Oh, yes. Oh. I love it. Yeah, you can't have it. Uh, <laughs> I was leading up to that. Um, it's Chinese. It's made of bronze. And we call this splashed gold. What they've actually done is to effectively make ormolu with it. They've put right. the gold splodges on and then fired it in. It's become part of the body, effectively. Right. And it's random. It's meant to be like that. It's not an off or anything. The gadroons here, the lotus leaves, stylized lotus leaves, are quite characteristic. Right. But what is very uncharacteristic, in fact extremely uncharacteristic, is this beaded border and the lines going through there, that sort of milling, is, it's just not Chinese. No, and what I think is happening here is that the maker of this has been influenced by the Jesuits. This would look most odd to a Chinese person and alien and they would like that. The heads here are of Buddhist lions. They're beautifully detailed and chiseled. Very, very finely done. In fact, the whole piece is really top quality. I would put this piece at around 1680 to 1720. Right. It's a fairly wide bracket, but I can't pin it down any more than that. Well, the question is, did your £450 improve over the years. Um, I think it probably did. Oh, God. I, I, I was thinking in my head of, of around 1000 to £1,500. Really? But I'm, I'm going out on a limb. I think I'm going to almost double that and put 1800 to 2500 on it. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> <clears throat> Lucky hubby. <laughs> it's a lovely thing though, isn't it? It is. That's the most it's important thing. thing, that it's beautiful. Now, I've got to say that that dish at one time must have belonged to a very careful baby. And I am that careful baby. You are. I am. Pass it to me, because um, what I'm in awe of is that it's all in one piece. True. And it's in nice condition. And these bright orange and yellow colours would, would have you thinking of Clarice Cliff. But I think it's fair to say that if I was to turn this over, I'd find that it was made by uh, one of her contemporaries. Because there's a nice mark that tells you everything you want to know. Susie Cooper. And what I like about it is the subject. Because, you know, I grew up with cowboys yes, and engines. Yep. And 
most of our generation did. We did. We did. You were one of those kids that were at the pitches on a Saturday morning. Uh, it certainly was. Ten o'clock every Saturday morning. Happy days. Six months ago, and you went home scratching. Definitely. <laughs> I see the colour's gone a little bit there, which does go against it. Um, from a value point of view, it's it's not a huge amount, um, but I think you you might on a good day be pushing around about a hundred pounds. Right. But it just goes to show that being a very careful baby does have its virtues in later life. Thank you very much indeed. As a child, I was fascinated by the Biggles characters and sort of the adventures they had. And, and this chap obviously seems a bit of a Biggles character. Can you tell me a bit about him? Well, he never really talked very much about the war, but uh, I know that he joined the RMC right at the beginning of the war and he was in that for about two years. And mm. then he transferred to the RFC when it was getting going. And uh, he was in, in that as a pilot um, until 1919, until he was demobbed. And this is Captain Foreman? Captain Foreman, yeah. yes. And a, a relation of yours? He was my father, uh, yes. What's so lovely about this collection is, is this is really the, the birth of the RAF, as it were. I mean, it, it's from 14 to 18, uh, it was obviously Royal Flying Corps, in 1918, it became the RAF. So it's yes. lovely to have such an early collection. Do you know whereabouts he served? Well, I know in 1918, at least from the diaries, uh, he seems to have been in various places. He mentions Lille and he mentions Ypres. And a lot of the photographs were uh, taken over the front lines um, in those places and round about. And, and this is part of the job, was it, the aerial reconnaissance? Mo he, that was most of his job, aerial photography, yes. And dodging bullets. Yes, yeah. yes. But he does seem, yes. from the photographs, to have been a bit accident prone, is that? Well, I think it's part of the fault of the planes. I mean, there were such sort of uh, primitive things that uh, they seemed to crash and cause trouble right through, from his diaries, yeah. anyway. This is the sort of thing that, that rather took my eye. Uh, in February 1917, undercarriage caught molehill on wow. landing and broke side strut of undercarriage and king post. I mean, yeah. a molehill. You, I mean, like you say, primitive is the word. I mean, it's, it's the, uh, it was in its infancy then. Oh, you know? absolutely, I mean, planes yes. Planes were, you, you literally diced with death yeah. every time you went up, and that's what makes them such fascinating characters. I particularly like this diary entry where it says uh, can only put the crash down to overconfidence and uh, nearly proved fatal. He's, he's almost modest in, yeah. in, in what he did. Yes. Uh, and this is obviously him after one of the crashes. That's right, yes. Well, I think it's the one that this um, propeller was brought back from. Right. And he seems quite happy there having a cigarette as if it was a yes. daily experience. Yes, not as if it just crashed, no. And this propeller, I mean, it's almost like you can feel the force of the impact. I mean, the way it's shattered, uh, it, it's just amazing that he lived. Yes, it is. And it's amazing to think that just such a thin piece of canvas is all that separated you from life and death. Yes. Tell me a bit about the medal, because that's a, a, a Second World War medal, if I might. Well, it is, yes. Um, he was awarded the DFC in 1918, and after the war, he loaned it to Leeds City Museum because they didn't have a DFC. And during the war, uh, the museum received a direct hit and mm. it was totally destroyed. And quite a long time afterwards, an envelope arrived with this in it, which was all that was left of wow. the DFC, but they must have sifted through all the rubbish and they actually sent him that. So then he applied for another one from the war office and, and so he's got one, but of course the ribbon isn't the same because the Second World War ribbon was mm. diagonal. It shows how, I mean, to have sifted through that much rubbish, I it know. shows how precious these things were mm. and how rare. And then we've got a box of bits. The box of bits, yes. Let's have a, have a look. A bullet on a chain. Why is that on a chain? Well, he was wounded just a fortnight before the end of the war and um, that's the bullet that hit him. And he always kept it afterwards on his watch chain. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he also had it engraved. Yeah, Captain J.W. Foreman, DFC, RAF. Yes. Belgium, 
1918, which again is lovely. I mean, it's lucky it didn't kill him. I mean, was it only a, it is lucky. <laughs> only a minor wound? Well, I never quite knew where it was. But <laughs> I think it was on his uh, bottom. <laughs> it shot him in the bottom. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, I suppose if there's one place you want to be shot, that's uh, probably that. I mean, that's so lovely to have. I suppose it came through that. the plane. Actually, sure. Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, that's what they would do. They would take mm. pot shots at these mm. planes. They weren't fast flyers. So, you know, it was such a dangerous place to be. Mm. I just love it. I could spend hours going through it. Value-wise, if you were to put a value on it, easily eight thousand pounds auction price, really? probably ten thousand, <laughs> because it's such a complete account. Well, that's right. and thank you very, very much for bringing it in. Oh well, it's a pleasure. It's not just the objects that make the Antiques Roadshow. It's the stories behind them too, and sometimes they take on a different twist once the programme's gone out. Remember this extraordinary meeting at our recent sports relief programme. So this is your father. Yes, Trevor Foster. And this is your father. Yes, I co -wins. And they both played in the British Rugby League Tour of Australia in 1946. Yes. So presumably you two have known each other a long time. No. Remarkably, no. We met today for the first time. I was in the queue and I saw the jersey come out and I said to my wife, that's the same as my father's. So I walked over and had a closer look and saw that it was 1946, the indomitable tour, and produced mine. Quite incredible, and I think you two have got rather a lot of catching up to do, haven't yes, you? Yes, we have. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad to say Simon Foster's here with us today. I mean, it must have been bizarre, <laughs> wasn't it, meeting Mike Owens like that? It was a surreal moment for you. Fantastic experience, yes, and so much has happened since. Oh, tell us about it. Well, the first thing was the uh, development of an exhibition. Oh, right. At the Rugby League Heritage Centre in Huddersfield. And have other people come forward, approached you with mm. other memorabilia since then? Yes, I've had several phone calls and uh, a number of the forwards who played with my dad, including Doug Phillips, uh, whose daughter lives in Neath, South Wales, and she was kind enough to invite me down. She said she had a trunk in an attic which ought to be opened. She felt it was of the 46 tour and uh, had a lot of items in it. When I got down there a few weeks ago, it was a real treasure trove. We found all sorts of amazing things, including, for example, this jersey, which uh, the jersey, of course, very special because the link at Lords was the two jerseys I co in Trevor Foster, number 24, 26. Right. We now have number 22, Doug oh, Phillips' jersey. Other players have made contact through their relatives. Uh, obviously, all, all the players are now deceased. And we're going to have a reunion in a couple of months' time at the Rugby League Heritage Centre uh, to celebrate. So, because of the roadshow, then, all this has come together? It has, yes. Yes, the story unfolds and uh, I'm sure uh, it will develop even further in the future. But it's been a marvellous journey for me. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming in. And there's another person who's still pinching himself after visiting the roadshow. At Annick last year, remember Sean Sewell with his charming diaries? We've got six wonderful diaries here. They are completely wacky, off the wall, and during a time of war. And who are they by? Uh, it's Thomas Cairns Livingstone, who was a gentleman who lived in Rother Glen in Glasgow at right. the turn of the 19th century, 20th century. They're just absolutely hilarious. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're not worth printing. Yeah, I'd love to see him in a, a wider audience. I think <laughs> the amount of work and effort he's put into him, I think he deserves uh, to be seen. I remember those diaries. They were a unique insight into the life of an ordinary family in World War I. And I gather the phone started ringing, Sean, after you'd appeared on the programme. They did, yeah. It got a huge amount of interest after the uh, show went out on a Sunday. I couldn't believe like, how much interest from there. I thought my five minutes of fame was over when the programme went out, but it carried on all that week and from ever since, really. And so, is it going to be published now? It is. Uh, it's due out uh, this September, so it's due out soon. It must be very exciting that you know you had these diaries and now everyone else is going to get the chance to read them. Yeah, I'm really pleased about that. It's nice to see everyone's got a chance to read the diaries and, and you know go for the keyhole into Thomas's world and find out about you know his time in the First World War. It's absolutely fascinating. Amazing. So what's next? A film? Who knows? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm just waiting for that phone call, I think. <laughs> see what happens. Steven Spielberg, get uh -huh, your heart yes. out. You see, coming on the road show, you never know what's going to happen. Uh -huh. It can be a life-changing event. Well, as violins go, that's actually quite a nice violin back, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Are you the player? Sadly not, no. My wife is, not me. And uh, has it come through the family, or did she buy it, or what? Yeah, it was given to my uh, wife, who used to live in the Orkney Islands, and um, 
It was given to her as a child from a, an aunt who played in the um, Royal Edinburgh Philharmonic, I think. Uh-huh. And she used to take it to school on the back of the bus. Yeah. Play it and learn it, but then gave it up as, you know, when she sort of went to university. Yeah. And it's just been at home ever since. Right. So it's silent at the moment. Pretty much so. Well, I have to say that my heart sinks whenever I see a violin in the queue because. I look inside and I know what I'm going to see, and I'm afraid some of that is true for this violin. We look inside, we see the label, and we see the most famous maker in the world, yeah. Antonio Stradivario. Well, that's what it says, Antonio Stradivario. Above it, it says, Imitazione di Antonio Stradivario. Now, that's a good deal more honest than many of the Stradivarius labels I see on the roadshow. And then below it says, Fatta de Degani Eugenio, anno 1886. My Italian's not good enough to say that. So, Eugenio Degani, it's quite a well known name. Yeah. And, um, and certainly, this is a, a quality violin. It's a hell of a lot better than the imitation Stradivarius violins we generally see. What's, what makes a, a good violin a good violin? Well, you've got that fantastic back, beautifully selected wood, and when you play the light on it, you can see the, the modelling of this thing. People are under the impression that violins are made by steaming the wood into this shape. They're not, they're carved. Okay. So they start off being that thick as a wedge, and then they're carved into this shape. Um, I'm not a violin expert, but I can tell you that the last Dugan's uh, that came up for auction in London uh, quite recently fetched in excess of twenty thousand pounds. Right. She better start to learn to play again, hasn't she? Really. It's been in our immediate family for fifty years. I understand that it was bought by my husband's father, and it was looked at in 1956. So we know that it's been in the family as long as that. Right. And do you know how old it is? I've got an idea that it might be as, as old as 14th century, something like that. Well, I think it dates from about 1380, 1390. Um, mm. And it's a spectacular piece. And if we look at it, we can see that it depicts the saints within an arcaded background. And we can pick out some of the saints. Uh, you've got St. John the Baptist here with a lamb. Uh, here you have St. Paul and St. Peter with the keys. And then St. Christopher with the young Christ on his shoulder. So most of the saints are recognisable. Mm. And it's in pretty good condition considering its age. One has to be slightly careful of ivories like these because in the 19th century there were a lot of imitations and copies made. But I think looking at this piece, particularly if we look at the traces of the gilding and the damage to uh, some of the ivory, um, I'm confident that this is a 14th century piece and not a late 19th century copy. It was almost certainly made in northern France where they were carving wonderful ivories like this at that time. And it would have been used for devotion really and for prayers and the owner might have had it out on display and uh, it's just a wonderful piece of French carving of that period. Do you have it hanging on the wall? Or? Mm. It, well, it, it was hanging on the wall until we decorated and decided not to spoil the decoration, but it ought to go back, really, I think. Oh, I think it should, <laughs> yes. It's a wonderful piece. If this came up at auction today, I'm reasonably confident that it would fetch in the region of £15,000. <laughs> you think we really should put it on the wall? <laughs> So this is a very exotic looking thing, almost oriental thing. Tell me about it. Why did, why did you think you were going to bring it today? We did, I didn't even want to stand in the queue with it, to tell you the truth. Why is I that? Just thought, I just thought it was, you know, but <laughs> did it for Louise. And yeah. then when you recognised it and said it was interesting, well, that just changed yes. it a little well, bit. Well, it right? does change it a bit. Yeah. And, and so no guesses as to what it is. No. I mean, I think... My daughter's yeah. husband said it was a Russian love cup or something. But mm. She's no idea. It came handed down in the family, she said. Yeah, she? my uncle has Rus Russian um, ancestors um, and it was passed down in his family. Um, and apparently it was used um, in a wedding um, for the bride and groom to 
drink out of. It's perfectly possible. It's actually quite a conventionalised shape for um, a, a, an object like this, and it's called a kofsh. It's a, it's a Slavonic shape. It's a bit like having a sort of Union Jack on the table in a three-dimensional right. form. It was to do with Holy Russia, with the ancient history of Russia, and everybody saw this thing. It was an object that evoked patriotism. And some are vast, huge, big as this table, and some are even smaller than that. Mm. And you had them around the home because they were um, essentially Russian. The technique is Russian. It's made in about 1900. It's in revival of the 17th century taste. It's cloisonné enamel. And it's a piece of Russian silver. Did you think of it as silver before or yes, not? Yes, I thought, I thought it was silver. I said to yeah. the Louis, I thought it was silver. But... Mm, of course, the, the colour is absolutely permanent mm. in enamel. And, and it's very bright and colourful. And I suppose you've got to consider um, um, who, it, who it might be made by. There are various um, suppliers of these things in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And some are called Ovchinikov and some are called um, Klebnikov. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the most important one of all is a goldsmith who was court furniture to Nicholas and Alexandra, um, uh, who made things at the highest possible pitch of luxury, and he's called Karl Fabergé. And he's right? also the maker of your cough. He's not. Honestly. He is. The Fabergé. <laughs> <laughs> And but the reason that we know that with absolute certainty is that there's this little mark here, and it looks just like a little, a little line with a dot above it, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. But it's actually Cyrillic, and it says K. Fabergé. Oh, no. And above it is the <laughs> stylized Romanov eagle, which is the royal warrant for Nicholas and Alexandra. To me, it was just a trinket, you know, it's just... Yes. <laughs> well, I suppose it was a trinket in a way, but it was a trinket yes. from the best shop, yes. really, in Europe <laughs> and, and, and in Russia. And what it does for us is evoke a very rich incomparably rich moment in Russian history just before the revolution and so the excitement is mounting isn't it? Mm -hmm. Are you ready really? for it? Yes it is because <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you something rather astounding that an object of almost exactly this dimensions um, by this maker um, in a very similar vein indeed fetched 20,000 pounds under the hammer recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Goodness me. Glad you brought it. Very glad. <laughs> maybe take a taxi home or maybe not. <laughs> take me home on a stretcher, really. <laughs> it's not even mine. I can't believe it. We, mm. we didn't even begin to think of anything like that, did we? No, I'm not surprised, really. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Well, we'll call an ambulance for Geoffrey in a moment. Who knows, though, if there are any Russian billionaires out there watching? We might have sparked a bit of a bidding war for that particular piece of Fabergé. We've had a lovely day here on the lawns of the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. And in case you're wondering, that stately parlour behind me, it isn't their main house, that's Chatsworth, of course. This is their shooting lodge. It's not bad for a weekend place. I've so much enjoyed my first day here at the Roadshow. I hope you have too. From the lawn of the hall at Bolton Abbey. Bye-bye. And there's more next Sunday at the earlier time of seven. And this coming Thursday, the 11th of September, Fiona and the team will be recording the Antiques Roadshow.